Okay, yeah, so we were just saying this was a much harder chapter. Mm -hmm. Chapter 7, action within the world. Finally getting into the real stuff. Right. Everything else was groundwork. Uncertainty was the last chapter. Yeah, it kind of like hit me like a ton of books. <laughs> and we're like, oh, this is easy. He's building it up one step at a time. He's going to lay these foundations. I know all this already. He's just yeah. restating. And then now it was like, we're going to put it to use. And like, min N minus 1, uti marginal utility. And right. You, uh, you like rank things like, oh, you have something of group A and something of group B, like class wants. Mm -hmm. um, you might label this. There's only ordinal um, relationships between the two. So like you want one and two of A and then three and four of B and then like five, six. It's <laughs> got yeah. really well, hard to follow. There was one section where you, like, you, you couldn't, you couldn't listen to it. You I, had to just. Yeah, read I was it. hoping. Do they do they have charts? They were like, go to the Mises dot org um, um, audio or uh, yeah, book. I don't know if they have charts. Uh, like I, I have the actual book. Right. And In the scholars edition, I don't think they have charts either. Oh, I mean, this isn't the. Oh, maybe this. This is just the book. Yeah. yeah. Like the it's the same chapters the the audio book with like normal it's, size print. It, yeah, the same pages, but. So huge. Right. I mean, there's there's no real charts or anything to make it easier, but um, yeah. So that part, I think by the end of it, it started to digest it, and I'm starting to get the law of returns. But like, I definitely need to study this some more. I listened to it twice. The basic gist of that really complex part, what I took away from it, is that. <clears throat> Um, you can't measure as like uh, in, in the same way that you can measure the, the burning capacity of coal, like what utility you'll get out of something because it's always changing, mm -hmm. it's relationship based, um, and um, it's ordinal based. Yeah. An analogy I try to think of in my head while I was reading it was... I was picturing I have like a giant Sunday in front of me. Yeah. And so like <laughs> right away as like a bunch of utility, like I really want that Sunday, that Definitely. ice cream. Yeah. And then I get I get like into the middle of it and I start feeling sick of myself, like, oh I just ate all that ice cream, I'm not feeling good. Yeah, I feel horrible. And then like there's been times where, you know, you just keep going and like towards the end you start to feel better, I guess. <laughs> <You know? laughs> what? Oh, it starts yeah. to get so you get more utility as maybe you digest it more. But and it's you're the same. finishing the... Oh, because things, things have changed. The yeah, things have changed. changed. It's the same thing, but all of a sudden it just it, it starts tasting good again. You get over your stomach ache. Or it's a little more melty, and so you it's right. that is, is different or whatever. Well, the one I was thinking is the one they used in the book, which was, um, I thought, a good... I wish they used more examples. I wish yeah. he, he used more examples. But um, he used the example of dyeing wool, and he was like, mm -hmm. you know, if you've got too much dye, it's not gonna be good if you use it all, and if you don't have enough, then it's not. It's it's also not good. So right. It's like, yeah, a lot of it still had that marker of obviousness, but he states things in such a way that it sounds really complex. Yeah. But it's just like so irrefutable statement of fact like uh he used this one expression where he said um that oh shoot i lost it i guess yeah. it doesn't matter yeah i feel like i'm always just thinking of the concept like everything you think of everything as like an individual instance and it, every individual or every instance changes as time goes on. But right. That, that's like just the main principle of this whole school of thought. Well, and, and what you can do with things. And also that, that labor is, or um, recreation is a um, 
luxury good or a, a value or something that, that people want something yeah. of, but it also gives diminishing returns. Um, the I remember what a, what I just lost. It was that um, he was describing with the n minus one of like if you choose something that if there was n minus one of it then it satisfies, then you know that it satisfies just one, uh, one unit more of your um, like desire for satisfaction uh, or your most urgent need. Mm -hmm. um, and then you, you don't need to know anything about the particular case or about the world. You, you can deduce a priori that if you chose that thing, then that satisfied your most urgent need up until that point. Right, like... Uh, one more is added. Yeah, your rank order system is determined through your actions. Yes. Alright, so, uh, let's go through the questions. Okay. I think, uh, it's mislabeled here. This has uncertainty in action, but that's not the label. It's the law of marginal utility. Uh-oh. Typo in the study guide. Um, action can only be expressed by ordinal numbers, but how are quantitative facts involved? Um, is this the example where he says about uh, logs of wood? Like, if you have 30 logs... Yeah, I think he... Yeah. And it's the fact that, like, we live in the real world where there are, there's, like, a limited supply of things and there's a quantity. Well, them. also, the, the quantity, so action can only be expressed by ordinal numbers. So, like, I want a house rather than a raincoat. But if I only have 30 logs, I can't make a house. I need 100 logs. And, uh... If, and I would keep the raincoat, but if I had 95 logs, I would give that raincoat away for like anything to get five logs right. to finish that house. Um, but if I only have like 10 logs, no way I'm giving away a raincoat for even 10 or 20 logs. Mm -hmm. So it, quantity is involved. <clears throat> what implies choice from a praxeological point of view? Action. Yeah. Okay, so given the following scale. Okay, I don't know how... A, first unit. A, okay. second unit. B, first unit. A, third unit. B... Wait a minute, what? Okay, so I think all the next questions are based on this rank order scale. Oh, this is a rank of class units, right? <clears throat> the, it's, it's the exact same thing we were talking about earlier. So there's like class ones. Okay. So you might want, I don't know what the example was in the book. They talked about bread versus silk. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Okay, so if the actor possesses the nine items shown, will he prefer to lose two units of A or one unit of B? One unit of B. Because it comes after the, the first and second um, most desired ones. But B is also a first unit. Yeah, but it comes third in the list meaning that he wants it uh, one degree less than two. I don't, I think, no, I think A and the A on number one and the A on number two are different. But yeah. The A on number one and the, the B on number three are, are equal in terms of value. They can't be equal. They're both first unit. 
Yeah, it's the first unit of, there's, uh... Oh, the first... Four... There's... Oh, okay. There's four units of A, and there's five... Or no, there's five units of A, and okay. four units now of B. Now I understand. So he wants, let's call it bread. Um, he would rather have two pieces of bread and no silk. Okay. A is bread, and, and B is silk. So, if the actor already possesses three units of A and three units of B, he will prefer, which will he prefer, one unit of B or one unit of A? Oh, wait a minute, yeah, so, maybe you're right, I think I was reading the question wrong. I presumed he had no units, but he has, he has all nine. So if he has all nine, would he prefer to lose two units of A or one of B. So you go in the opposite direction. Right, okay. So... He'd prefer to lose one unit of B, actually. Because B is the lowest order. Yeah, that sounds right. Okay. Yeah, totally. Alright, great. I'm glad we figured this out. Okay, so he possesses three of A and three of B. Um, so that means... Would he prefer one additional unit of A or one additional unit of B? If he's got three of each. Well, so he has... Once he has three of each, he would prefer one more of A. Because it comes after six. There's seven is a fourth unit of A. Okay, yeah, I agree. If the actor must choose between all five units of A versus all four units of B, can we say which he will select? I would say A because the fifth unit comes before the fourth unit of B. Ooh. That is a good observation. I didn't know how we were going to determine that. I figured that because A is the first and second unit that it would be A, but that's not correct because, you know, things can change after that. But you notice that he wants the fifth unit of A before he wants the fourth unit of B. Therefore, if he has to choose between all five of A and all four of B, he would choose all five of A. Right. That is cool. I wish I had a list of how much I want things <laughs> in the world <laughs> so that it would be nice and easy to make choices. Yeah, I mean, I feel like my brain's just woken up now. <laughs> yeah, you having coffee? Yeah. Um, what is the definition of utility? I knew they were just going to say, like, they, they gave a, just a, a frank definition and I was like, I should write that down. Did you? No. <laughs> it was like, it was really good though, but it was a little complicated. Maybe, maybe uh, Robert Murphy put it in his study guide. Marginal utility, let's see, no. Util. It's the, isn't it the belief, it has to do with the belief in the, um, the belief in the yield it can have towards an end. Action that demonstrates the end most highly valued by the actor. Utility? I think, uti oh, wait. I think utility is, you know, the, the belief in something to achieve an end you want. Um, so... Yes, that sounds right. The utility of a thing is the... So, like, means have utility to the end. To, to achieve the end. You, you, you right, because it. you have a perceive. It's a perception. Utility is all perception. Right. Okay. There was a really nice definition. I should have written it down. What distinguishes subjective use value from objective use value? So this is the burning coal. Yeah, exactly. Example. So 
you know, coal objectively can heat a room X number of degrees, uh, where subjective use value is, well, maybe you can use a coal for something else, or <laughs> maybe you yeah. want to put it in someone's stocking, or I don't know. Uh, yeah, yeah, I guess that sounds right. Um, how was it possible to solve the value paradox? Who solved the problem? I don't remember what this is. Maybe it's in the study guide. Is it one of the uh, guys that he talked about? The value paradox. He said there was a, a guy, but he got it wrong. Well, oh. I think he was talking about a class of contemporary uh, economists and why they couldn't solve the value paradox. Well, I don't know, and it's not in the study guide. It's I think he's talking about Max Weber. That could that be. Help? Yes. Faber. He said that there was a term in there uh, named. Okay. Max. So, thus, neither Bernoulli nor the mathematicians and economists who adopted his mode of reasoning could succeed in solving the paradox of value. Okay. Meaning what? What is the paradox of value? Oh, I'll read a little bit. So he did not see that in the value choosing and acting, there is no measurement and no establishment of equivalence, but grading, such as preferring and putting aside. Mm -hmm. Thus, mm -hmm. neither Bernoulli nor the mathematicians and economists who adopted his mode of reasoning could succeed in solving the paradox of value. Right, because they had the wrong idea about it altogether. They thought it was more mathematical. It was uh, additive, or right. So this is the ordinal versus um, card cardinality. Yeah, um, they thought it was arithmetic. So, right. So the mathematicians used you know cardinality and like numbers, where it's all rank order and grading. Right. So what is the second part of that? Who solved the problem? Okay, so Max Weber, I believe, is the one. So the mistakes inherited in the confusion of the weber fechner law of psychophysics and the subjective theory of value have already been attacked by Max Weber. Max Weber, it is true, was not su sufficiently familiar with economics and was too much under the sway of his historicism to get correct insights into fundamentals of economic thoughts. I think it was Max Weber. This whole page is about Max Weber. Okay. And he, I think he came up with the theory of marginal utility. Are prices derived from subjective use values? Well, uh, yeah, because yeah. of the utility that they can provide. Right, exactly, like the, the raincoat and the log example. Yeah. <clears throat> Is total utility relevant for praxeology? Um, what is total utility? So, I think, is it the utility of all units of A? Uh, uh, right, uh, being able to have all of a thing. Like, um, the total utility of gold versus iron. Right. Um, the answer is no, because you can't act on total utility, I would say. Yeah, you and... You've never experienced that. And you're not, you're not choosing between gold and iron. You're choosing between the 
satisfaction that gold and or iron could yield. In a limited quantity, too. Right, in a limited quantity. Yeah, too. that's all you have access to. Trick question. What can marginal utility explain that total utility can't? Um, that you would want, you know, a drop of water in the desert versus a million pounds of gold? Right. Yeah. Um, does praxeology have a need for the notion of class of wants? I would say no. Why? So, class of wants, like we said, was, uh, you know, bread. Right, you can't say that bread, bread has is to better. do with, like, yeah, uh, you know, your has to do with your nutrition and silk has to do with your um, preference to live in luxury. Right. And hmm. what? I thought I had a good answer for this. That sounds right. What pra pra uh, Does praxeology have a need for the notion of class of wants? No, because you don't make a determination Praxeologically, you don't make an action about bread mm -hmm. in general. You make an action about a particular piece of bread or a loaf of bread, uh, okay. not all bread. Right, yeah. Versus all wood or all silk. That's true. Right. Yeah, because yeah, some sources of nutrition are better than others versus like some luxury goods. Yeah, and the context here is I think he's referring he's he's criticizing contemporaries who were who were falsely in his estimation using the term the class of wants to give a higher ordinal number to a, an entire class of yeah. goods. This like, seems you're wrong, to guys. tie in with like the last chapter of you know freak like the class frequency versus like just looking at the individual mm -hmm. and the same thing when they like the early ch chapters when they talked about like Marxism yeah why can't we compare valuations of different people it's all subjective scale yeah people have different um, capacities for labor and different desires for recreation and everything in between. Uh, what are the flaws in Bernoulli's approach to the law of diminishing marginal utility? Uh, wasn't it that he... <clears throat> I don't know, what do you think it is? I think it was... I think I just read a little bit. I, I think it's because he didn't uh, like every he didn't account for like each individual's different. Oh really? That's it. I think so. Uh, I thought it was that he tried to assign a quali quantitative amount to it, like oh this is the I don't know. I actually I just don't know the answer to the question. What are the flaws in Bernoulli's approach to the law of diminishing marginal utility? What was Bernoulli's approach? So this is like, thus either Bernoulli nor the math mathematic mathematicians and economists who adopted his mode of reasoning could see. Oh, it's because they use they're using um, cardinal numbers versus yeah. Ordinality. Okay, great. So that's that's correct. There are no arithmetical operations possible with the utility ascribed to various units. Exactly. Boom. <laughs> Law of returns. <clears throat> Why isn't a recipe considered an economic good? Because you could use it over and over again, and it never diminishes. So I have a problem with this. So, you know, software is just a recipe. Yeah. 
So is software not an economic good? No. Uh, it's not. The delivery mechanism for it is. But you have to put in labor to make software. Yeah, but that's not where value comes from. Your ability to use it is where the value comes from, the utility, right? Mm -hmm. That's what we just said, like, uh, 20 minutes ago. <laughs> okay. <It's>, um, <clears throat> the, so software is a recipe <clears throat> for making your computer do something, and your ability to get it is the thing that um, incurs the price, not the, the thing itself. Because that could be replicated again and again and again, ad infinitum. Right, no but cost. it could be, like, if you have a recipe, I want that recipe, so I'll, I would bid a price for it. Yeah. You'll, you'll do, you'll do, you'll pay whatever price to, to get it. That recipe. And it's the getting that is the cost, not the recipe itself. So if I have a cookbook... I can sell you the cookbook, and I'm selling you a book with pa papers and pages and words, and that's the delivery mechanism for the recipe. Okay. But the recipe does not, in itself, uh, is not an economic good. Okay. So you could use that over and over again. Does that make sense? Am I uh, totally off base here? I mean, I mean, it, it. I can see how that could make sense. Just so like. Coca-Cola locks up their <clears throat> formula in a vault. Yeah. It's not an economic good. Well, what are they protecting? In in that case, um, I would say, it, in their case, it is. It's a it's a secret formula. It's a recipe. It's a it's a recipe that only they control, though. So, if I I think this recipe, he's he's talking about like how to bake an apple pie. Or how to make coffee was the example, which is like cats out of the bag about making coffee. Anyone can use that. It's like open source software. Oh, uh, okay. So but if you're closed source software, is an economic good. Yeah, I would say so. Okay. Yeah, that makes more sense to me. The and the reason why is because of the control that's exercised over the delivery. Okay. So, so if I'm Coca-Cola and I decide I'm going to publish the Coca-Cola cookbook, now I'm losing all the economic value from the recipe, but I'm gaining economic value from the cookbook. Okay. I don't know. I would be very curious to hear what other people think of this if they end up getting this far in the video. Yeah. If, if they have <laughs> some feedback on... Why isn't a recipe considered an economic good? Maybe there's just an answer in the book. No. What is the definition of the law of returns? Can we say it is a priori true? <clears throat> that generally you get diminishing returns over time, and that no, it's not a priori true? Um, well, I'd push back on that because uh, I think a criticism they kept talking about in the book is people only consider the law of diminishing returns, and then they used another, another law to describe... Uh, the law of what's the opposite of diminishing returns? Um, increasing marginal utility. Increasing marginal utility, <clears throat> where the law of returns, where those are both flavors of the law of returns, but on just different sides of the spectrum. <clears throat> yeah, they go together. Like it's the, the same thing. It's like they. It it's, is the yeah. It's, it's the same a different principle. name for the same principle. Yeah. <clears throat> Which problems can't be solved with the help of the law of returns?
you don't know yeah. which problems can't be solved with the help of the law of returns. I don't know what he's getting at. Hmm. So I think the most important thing to understand about the law of returns is that there's some optimal level yeah. for a, a given, um, what are you going to call it, a given input. Mm -hmm. And the more it moves past on either direction of that optimum, it changes the return. But the return isn't linear, and it's not necessarily following the same curve. Um, everything has a different um, return based on how you move that point in the middle. Mm -hmm. Like I wish I had a whiteboard here, but um, we have a whiteboard over there. Yeah. Do you want one? Um. Yeah. I think this makes more sense. This is how I thought about it. I moved it right here. Yeah, so like, uh, I think of it as like a, maybe a seesaw. And then, so here is, you know, the optimum point. Oh, okay, so it really, it reaches a, a tipping point and it gets right. extreme after a so, while. So, um, and then here, actually let me draw a graph. So it's uh, asymptotic? Right, so, or whatever. Yeah, so let's zero is so this is a graph. And the x x <laughs> Okay. Okay. So this is a graph and uh -huh. this is the input uh, on this axis. Input and then on this axis is the return. Yeah. So at at you know the optimum point right here. Yeah you get your optimum return. Yeah. And then as you move here, it follows some random distribution. Like, it's not linear. You, it's not like uh. you get a constant. <clears throat> it, so that's kind of a misperception that it's linear, but we have different value judgments at different periods of time. Right. Okay. That makes sense. I'm going to turn this around. <laughs> my terrible drawing. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if anyone will be able to see this, but this yeah. is the drawing. So, first started out with the teeter totter, but then this is yeah. a chart. That's it. Yeah, it's a graph where this is the maximum return, and if you move to the right, you have more input than the optimum, and if you move to the left, you have less input than the optimum. And the thing to notice is that the, the return can change at a different scale. But it's probably never going to be as high as the optimum. Well, that's or else it would be there, too. It'll never be. the, the op, By definition, the optimum yeah. <laughs> right. is at the top. Yes. Okay, cool. is labor not an end in itself? Is labor an economic good? Oof. Um, labor is a means to the end. People generally don't like labor. Work. By definition, it's not really labor. If, uh, if you're having fun, it's recreation. I don't know, I guess it could be both, but... Yeah, I struggled with this, too. They talked about, you know, rowing a boat recreationally versus being a slave. Right. And so, 
they're doing the same activity. Mechanically, it's the same, but it's not. Um, but why is it not? Why is it is it not? Um, I guess because of the, the human perception of what's uh, happening, like. Mm -hmm. You just know. I don't know what the. Uh, how do we not know what the difference is? We just know. One is right. One is. I think it's obvious that they're different, but yeah. I don't. I can't. I can't exactly say, say why. Say why. Um, <clears throat> is labor an economic good? Well, my intuition says yes, but why would that question even be asked? So, in a case, it is an economic good, and they, so, <coughs> I thought it was, there's a discussion around, imagine a world where labor wasn't scarce. Like, we live in a world where we have more material uh, economic goods than labor. For instance, like there, there's gold sitting in the ground right now. Right. <laughs> there's nobody mining right now. Yeah. So, because there's a there's a scarcity in labor. Yes. Uh, so that's why it's an economic good. Ah, because there's scarcity in right. labor. Yeah. Interesting. So if like they talked about maybe one day there'll be so many people in the world that or will be so efficient. Yeah, that we, um, there's an abundance of labor, but that's not the case. Like, you can <laughs> always go mine minerals or build something. Or there's a ton of shit to do. Yeah. Excuse me. Um, what is the relation between work and leisure? Why is work linked to Disutility. Because in order to work, you're giving up the utility of leisure. Ah, uh, that makes sense. And that as you leisure more, um, there begins to be disutility to that too. Um, Misi said something like, you know, there's a diminishing returns on leisure, right. just as any there is any other good. Yeah, <clears throat> which is really bizarre when he, when he said it. I thought of like summer when I'm in school and like, oh my god, I want the summer so bad. But then at the end of the summer, I'm like, get on with it. You know, like right. I'm done yeah. with this. Exactly. <clears throat> is leisure an economic good? Can we apply the principle of marginal utility? Asked and answered. How can we explain the tendency toward the reduction of working hours? How can we explain the tendency toward the reduction of working hours? So I guess this technology advances the yields like on our, our pr productivity greatens. Yes. And then so the marginal utility of us working more versus the satisfaction we get from the increased productivity is decreasing. Yeah, wow, that's a great way to put it. So, not only is our, <clears throat> our, our ability to produce, or what's the term? Yeah, our ability to produce is getting higher, and then the, we're getting diminishing returns from the stuff that we're producing at a higher clip. Right. <laughs> <clears throat> so it's, of course, we're going to work less because we value our leisure more than the return we're getting for that more work we do. That makes a lot of sense. What's next? What does non specific character mean in connection with human labor? NPC? Yeah. I don't even remember that part. And what does the NPC mean? What does NPC? What does NPC mean in non-player character? Non-specific character? No, I'm. I was just kidding. Oh, non-player. NPC mean is it's like that gray face meme. Oh. 
Uh, <clears throat> I don't remember reading this in the book. Let me see. What does non-specific character mean in connection with human labor? Page 55 of the study guide here at the bottom. What does it say? Um, I'm reading right now. Uh, everything that is true of a generic factor of production is hence true of labor. Hence, labor still receives special consideration from the economist because labor is the ultimate non specific factor. Uh, okay. Maybe he meant factor instead of character. Okay. I don't know. Uh, labor is required in every production process. Right. Moreover, in our world, labor is the scarcest of inputs. In the market economy with flexible wage rates, all willing laborers are channeled to those ends deemed most urgent. Mm -hmm. There is no analog to land that remains uncultivated. saying there. So like human labor is just non-specific. It's just right. a, a it's just in everything every economic good requires human labor. Yeah, they don't all require land or whatever, but they, mm -hmm. you know, labor is part of it. Why can a shortage of specialists only emerge in the short run, according to Mises? Well, I don't remember reading this, but I would deduce that... I, I remember this part. Oh. Um, so it's, uh, like, maybe, you know, let's talk about Bitcoin. Maybe there's a few people in the world that are really knowledgeable and specialized in Bitcoin. Yeah. But over time, so that's in the short run, I'd say there's a bunch of Bitcoin specialists. But in the long run, it's with tr a lot of training, it's like everyone will learn that if, if it's a valuable s skill, I mean, you could be a specialist in something that doesn't matter, and maybe you'll always be a specialist. But like if you're training, like there'll be, there'll always be training. And there's only a few instances where, uh, it takes a genius to, to do. Uh, and they treat, Mises talks about a genius like, kind of just like the universe's gift to the world. Nice. Um, which I didn't really like. I don't really understand it. Why? I think that's a weak way of describing a genius. And that's kind of, I think it's putting a bunch of people in one class. And kind of, yeah, I don't think that's a good way to deal with it. Saying there is a, a, a class called creative genius where, you know, I don't mean, we know all the people that might be in there. And then saying, okay, this law doesn't apply to them. Or like you, the, um, sp what, shortage of specialists? Yeah, no. no one's ever going to achieve that level of super genius, even if they get a lot of training, right? Isn't that what he's saying? I don't know. Yeah, in a way. <clears throat> um, well, no one's going to be Mozart. I mean, so, it doesn't matter how much training you get. There's a Mozart and no one else is. Right, but that doesn't explain the genius <clears throat> at all. It just... Well, the it saying just it's... it's I think it's like a week, it's like, oh, he's a genius, and like... That's just how it is, like, oh, it, there's gold over there. That's just, a, that's a, it's just a statement of fact, like, certain things exist in the universe. Yeah, uh, I guess. Some things exist in small quantities. That's true. Um, 
don't know, it just, it leaves me wanting to know more. Or sure. More. <clears throat> yeah, I would like to make more geniuses if I could. <laughs> um, in what conditions could there be an abundance in labor? So that's when the the material is actually scarce. Ah, uh, right. Um, yeah. But the, so you need, need a huge population increase. Uh, is labor more scarce than material factors of production? Yes. What does it mean for a market society? It means that you know, material factors have prices because they because they're more scarce, right? Or I'm sorry, labor is more so people like people get paid for their labor more than the the um, material factors because it's right. more scarce. Well, yeah, I don't think you can compare the two, like being paid more for labor than a material. I felt they might value the labor more than the input because the labor is more scarce so I'm willing to pay more for your construction work than I am for a piece of lumber mm -hmm. because your <clears throat> your labor is way more rare than lumber Okay. Um, I think we talked about geniuses. Are geniuses substitutable? And the answer is no. Um, on the point of labor, <clears throat> although many writers have misunderstood this fact, it is true that some workers derive pleasure from usually small applications of labor. Even so, it is still true that the vast majority of labor expended in our world involves disutility and that no social reform can elude the fact that humans will as a rule choose to engage in labor past the point at which it is immediately gratifying because they value the output more than the fortified leisure mm, that's sorry that's not what I thought <clears throat> I thought it was re relating to the last question okay um, production yeah Comment, man is creative only in thinking and in the realm of imagination. How is it erroneous to make a distinction between the employment of labor and that of material factors of production? How is it erroneous to make a distinction between employment of labor and that of material factors of production? Uh, because employment is a material factor of production. It's erroneous to make the mm -hmm. distinction. Yeah. <clears throat> They're the same. Why is a production an intellectual phenomenon that is guided by human reason? Because you're producing... The production is a means to an end, and the end is... Uh, the means is end is what the human wants and you know the means is how you're acting to uh, like how you're producing that so of course it's going to be driven through human reasoning I would say so I think that makes sense that was a hell of a chapter yeah well so that was part one of the entire book alright hey cool we got through part one yeah. We're on part two. That's mm -hmm. exciting. Action within the framework of society. Interesting. All right. So I guess to sum up the first part is kind of to build a foundation and then talk about uh, just action on its own. So it seems like now we're going to, we started talking about action in the actual real world, and now I think we're going to talk about like, different societies. 
Yeah, at first we were talking about human action itself. What is action? Why, how do people yeah. make the choices they make? Now, action within the framework of society, I guess it's going to involve some other people. Yeah. Great. That was awesome. Thanks for suggesting we do this study guide. Yeah. This is awesome.